Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please be seated. Thank you. We are delighted to welcome you all to the Royal Irish Academy this evening in our newly restored meeting room, which was done during the pandemic, and we are delighted to have it back. And for those of you who are here for the first time, those benches were the ones that were in the um, old parliament, which is now the Bank of Ireland. So it's a very historic building and uh, very historic seats. And I hope we're going to have a very historic discourse this evening. I'm Mary Canning, I'm president of the Royal Irish Academy. Also present this evening is uh, Professor Mary O'Dowd, uh, the Academy Secretary. Um, Academy discourses are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were presented in 1786 and historically the discourses were and are reserved for researchers and distinguished academics to reveal and discuss their work in public, usually for the first time. We now record these discourses and they are available on the Academy's website. And before uh, we begin this evening, uh, we do have a little bit of business to transact. Uh, the minutes of our last discourse, Academic Freedom, Threats Within and Without, which was held on the 7th of October 2022 here in Academy House with the distinguished public intellectual Michael Ignatiev. These uh, minutes are posted online. And as no members have informed me of any issues with these minutes, I will take these as approved and I will sign the minute book after this discourse concludes. This evening, we are privileged to welcome two speakers, two esteemed speakers for our discourse. Sir Peter Ratcliffe, MD, is a physician scientist who trained as a nephrologist before founding the Hypoxia Biology Laboratory at Oxford. His laboratory elucidated mechanisms by which human and animal cells sense oxygen levels and transduce these signals to direct adaptive changes in gene expression. For this work, he shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2019. Sir Peter holds appointments as Director of Clinical Research at the Francis Crick Institute in in London, director of the Target Discovery Institute at the University of Oxford, and is a distinguished scholar of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Responding to Sir Peter will be Professor Cormac Taylor, member of the Royal Irish Academy, Professor of Cellular Physiology at the School of Medicine and Medical Science and the Conway Institute University College Dublin. Following the lecture, we will have the opportunity for some questions from you, our audience in Academy House. We are being joined by quite a large number of people also online. So now to the discourse and over to you, Professor Radcliffe, and thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, most kind introduction. Um, I'm going to take you through my lab's work in cellular oxygen sensing. Um, the discovery is somewhat akin to a thermostat measuring heat, but this one measures oxygen levels, and it's used to adjust the body's responses to combat low oxygen levels, to deliver more oxygen or less oxygen in, in just the way as your room heating would adjust the heat. Now, oxygen's Im important to the body, so this is a significant piece of physiology. I I'll, I'll argue, because this is a sub-theme, that um, 
we didn't actually intend to discover what we discovered. We probably discovered about a thousand fold more than we thought we were going to do, and I'll come to that. And we're probably about a thousand fold less than understanding the totality of the process I'm going to describe. So I hope you can read the slides. Um, the subcurrent to this, um, the usefulness of useless knowledge. Um, th these are rather famous words of Abraham Flexner, the American educationalist writing in 1939. He, the, the article describes an interview with a businessman who, who uh, Flexner asked, what is, what is the most important thing that has been invented ever? And the businessman said, Marconi, the wireless. And Flexner's response, well, you know, the wireless is dependent on electricity. And of course, when people, Franklin, Voltaire, uh, described the phenomenon, it, it had no clear use to mankind. But how much more are those words true now than they were then? Um, so that's my theme. We're going to take, I'd like to try to take you through, that is a little bit technical, uh, but we're trying to do two things. We're trying to do the history over four centuries that led up to what we did, why we did it in the 20th century, not before, what was going before, and then, which is a little bit technical, what I did. So I'm assuming some of the science will be forgiven for being a little bit technical, but I have to do that. and. Um, to explain, hopefully, the chaotic nature of discovery. My lab was chaotic, but, but I'm unapologetic for that. I think most laboratories are chaotic in the way they discover things. So I, I, I'm sub-theming that. You can see that? Uh, the useless, usefulness of incomplete knowledge. So these qualifications, useful, that's, that's the word our politicians use, our our funders use, would you please deliver useful knowledge? And our journal editors have a different thing. They said, your findings are incomplete, so I can't publish them. Neither qualification of knowledge is legitimate, and in my view, and I hope I'll persuade you of that this evening, and um, I'm going to exemplify that. And um, for this, first of all, um, the beginning of the story. Um, uh, Newton had uh, written Principia. Uh, the people believed, or the educated people believed, that most things then would, would be explicable, the age of reason. And um, the question now was, what about biology? Is it different, or, or is it the same as, as, as Newtonian mechanics? And um, the first character I'm going to bring into this who is this? William Harvey, um, deduced, deduced, didn't show, deduced the circulation of the blood. And um, some very interesting things about Harvey's work, um, wh which are relevant to all of us today. Uh, he, he'd made these deductions by simple observation, ocular experiments, he called them, ocular experiments. So, unlike most uh, great advances, this was not dependent on new technology. It was dependent on observing the relation between the cardiac contraction and the pulse, the flow of blood from a severed artery, the direction of flow of blood in, in, in the veins. Now, you know, there's been a lot of people killed on the battlefield by the time Harvey wrote this. So there must have been many people who observed the flow of blood when a major artery was severed, but were not able to deduce that the prevalent theory that the blood was made in the liver and then transported to the, was inconsistent with, with what one observed. So Harvey, this was a new thing, uh, not just to believe others, but to actually look carefully, and that, that, that's part of science, of course. Uh, but um, we talked about incomplete knowledge. This is what he said. Um, all parts are nourished um, and quickened with the blood. If, if, as if uh, it was made barren, 
and then it returns to the heart. I mean, there was a lot missing. Uh, and, and he had his detractors. Um, this is what he wrote. Uh, people said, well, it can't be right. We can't see any purpose to it. And um, to those who will reject the circulation because they see neither the efficient nor the final cause of it, I say only this much. First, you must confess there is a circulation and you inquire what it is for. Rather simple, but we have the same thing. As I said, we've had this trouble with journal editors that they say, well, you know, what, 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 what's the point of this? It's not a complete story. We, but this, I would argue, was the first piece of correct human physiology. There are a lot of things that were not correct, but this is the first new piece. Harvey could have made uh, one more deduction uh, relevant to the purpose of circulation of blood, but that was done by Richard Lower, who um, worked with Robert Hooke in, in Oxford, actually. And, and he, he noticed that the blood changed color. Um, Harvey had noticed that, but Lower noticed it went, went through the lungs, and the lungs made it red. And uh, that was... Uh, could be mimicked outside the body by mixing air and blood and what made it go red. Uh, and um, he, he deduced nitrous spirit of the air, they couldn't know what it was, uh, vital to life, is mixed with the blood as it passes through the lungs. Harvey could have made that deduction, but he, he, he missed that one. Everything else was correct. So. But there was a lot of trouble, um, which we be a uh, reflection now. Um, th 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 this was uh, Samuel Johnson writing, I know not by living distection any discovery has been made by which a single malady is, is cured. I and mean, we, we have the same concern now, and the same impatience. Uh, Roy Porter writing of the uh, Age of Enlightenment, uh, as it related to medical science, great expectations, disappointing results. And again, we, we have now the same reflection in, in, in precision medicine, which I'll come to, which is, which is quite tricky, but, but some people are ambitious for it. Of course, it couldn't go forward. It, it had to be incomplete because chemistry was, was not mature. Uh, Newton, Newton had induced math and physics, but, but he wasn't a chemist. He believed in alchemy, amongst other things. And um, these guys said it right. Um, Scheller, Priestley, and Lavoisier, of course, credited with the discovery of oxygen. But the person I'm going to give the credit to is Anton Lavoisier, without a shadow of doubt. He was the one that deduced the chemistry, and it's the chemistry that we're we're talking about in life. They did, the others did deduce um, the existence of oxygen. Of course, they built on Robert Boyle's work on the, on the springiness of air. It wasn't just nothing, it was something. Once you said air was something, the question was, is there one type of that something or more? So it's one type of air. And, and, and they did these rather awful experiments of imprisoning mice in bell jars and waiting for them to die and showing that the air then had been exhausted and, and wouldn't wouldn't support the burning of a candle, um, but, but they, they didn't deduce the equivalence of that. They, they demonstrated that, that oxygen was, was, was being exhausted. Um, it was Lavoisier who, who, who did the chemistry, and here there was a technical innovation, the balance, so Lavoisier was able to weigh what was going on and demonstrate the burning increased the weight by the addition of oxygen to what was being burnt. And he, I've written it out here. He, he, he deduced the equivalence in terms of carbon dioxide production of the burning of charcoal and the metabolism of a guinea pig. So this is a second first in this field. In my view, this is the first reductionist biology, i.e. the first evidence that a biological function, metabolism of a guinea pig, could be represented by a chemical formula, that of the burning of, 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 of carbon with oxygen. Um, Lavoisier wasn't appreciated either. Um, and um, of course, he supplemented his income as a tax collector, which didn't bring him much favor in, France, in revolutionary France. And um, 
his dear wife, who, who actually married him, but at the age of 13, it was an arranged marriage, uh, but they clearly loved each other, at least she loved him. He, he didn't speak English, so she translated everything uh, for him. And um, she made a plea uh, against the death sentence uh, on grounds of his importance to science. This was the response. I don't really need to translate love a public n'a pas besoin de savant, nous de chemiste. Uh, we didn't need you. So uh, off with the head. Um, they later realized that was a mistake and uh, <coughs> apologized to her. Uh, no doubt uh, a matter of unspeakable but grief to her. But that was the first reductionist biology in my view. First physiology, first reductionist biology. Um, uh, of course, it needed a bit of explaining why the blood was red, and, and that was Hop Solar who, who deduced that what was happening was the combination of hemoglobin in the blood pigment with oxygen, uh, with molecular oxygen, ma ma made it red. So, so now we had something we can begin to understand what the blood's doing. But we're, we're talking about well over 100 years uh, between these. these uh, uh, um, conclusions. Um, but you know, um, life is not just, well, there is a defining, many people try to define life in different ways, but I will define it this way, uh, that life and trains a necessary quality of life is homeostasis. So there's a difference between combustion, which of course can make an explosion, and metabolism, which occurs in your body, the same chemical process but it's controlled, otherwise you would burn up. So homeostatic chemistry underpins all the other, in my view, definitions of life, that of replication, that of cell theory, all the rest. You can't do any of this without, without control. So uh, who, who was the person here? This is Claude Bernard, a uh, French, Frenchman, uh, again. Um, and, and oxygen homeostasis, the control we're going to talk about it was one of his first, fourth, uh, first um, four principles, um, uh, but but he, he didn't too much work on oxygen. Uh, he did he did bring that out in in, in his idea of, of how uh, life had to be, um, and the the credit here should should go to one or other of these people, uh, Paul Baer, his student. Uh, but the interesting man was uh, Denis Jourdanet. He, again, a question of marriage. So um, Jourdanet married a wealthy woman who, who, who uh, probably had tuberculosis. He, he took her to South America to the Heights on, on the belief that would improve her health. Uh, it didn't, and um, she died, uh, but, but he's presumably quite a character. He married another second wealthy woman, so he's now extremely wealthy, and he used the money, uh, apart from doing his own experiments, to fund the lab of Paul Bear, the student of, of, um, of Claude Bernard, and, and, and it was Paul Bear who's uh, famous La Pression Baromique, uh, he deduced that the symptoms of altitude sickness were those of low oxygen and could be mimicked in a chamber if you pulled the oxygen level down. So um, we're, getting, we're getting close to oxygen sensing now, but the, the credit that um, I want to give for the person that inspired my own work and my own reason for going into this uh, belongs on, on uh, John Scott Haldane's famous expedition to Pike's Peak um, to measure the body's responses to low oxygen. They had been to Ben Nevis, which you'll know is in Scotland. Um, the problem with the expedition there is it's not high enough. The weather's appalling. They lost a lot of equipment and, and came back with no results. Pike's Peak is different. It's more than 4,000 meters. It had a pleasant hotel on the summit, so they didn't have to endure the climate. Um, but but the, 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 the heroine, rather, here, I uh, hope you can see her, Mabel Fitzgerald. Um, being a woman, she, she was not admitted. She couldn't be admitted to Oxford University, but Haldane took her on this expedition, paid, paid for by Sir William Osler. 
Um, but the men became uncomfortable that she was not chaperoned in this rather nice hotel with the rest of them. So uh, she went off and made uh, the measurements at intermediate altitude on Pikes Peak. This was, of course, not shortly after, or probably still was, the Wild West, the mining towns, gold mining and so forth, in, in the vicinity. She seemed to be quite a powerful character. The miners loved her, and these are the measurements she made at um, intermediate altitude in acclimatized subjects. So th these people have been living there, for, so it's, that's important to the story. They were acclimatized. And you see those graphs there, you, you have to be a scientist to see that they, they have a slope. They, and and, and um, what it shows is the extraordinary sensitivity of these responses, the, the hemoglobin response and actually breathing, which I'll come to. So as you breathe more, your carbon dioxide level goes down. There's a top graph, the bottom one's the, the blood level. So the blood level goes up. And it does so actually, if you live at 300 meters above sea level, on average, your hemoglobin will be a little bit higher than those who are absolutely at sea level. And that, those were the findings that drew me to the field. I'd love to say I drew the field because I could see that it was important. That is not true, uh, and it's rarely true. Uh, and it's a poor advice for the young people who are seeking a career in science. The most important thing is, is the question you ask. That is true, but I didn't pick this one because I thought it was important. I picked it because I thought it was tractable. And this is the reason I thought it was tractable was this extraordinary sensitivity. Now we're fast forwarding to the late 20th century. This is the, the response you make to donation of blood. Give a, a, a pint of blood, you make the blood back precisely. And there's a mechanism of sensing oxygen that enables you to do that. There was one other interesting uh, aspect of this system that suggests that it was something definable cobalt poisoning increases the number of red cells just like altitude so cobalt poisoning mimics altitude very odd thing this is a demonstration it's a rather interesting piece of ethics um, you'll see what they did in the upward part they, they gave cobalt to consenting volunteers so-called with serious psychiatric diseases which were in a, a North American hospital, it could be nameless. Um, they didn't kill anyone, but they demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that cobalt would push your, your blood up and then all they, they took the blood away. So those two things uh, led me to believe uh, that it was, was tractable. Um, I had, as people talk about mentorship, the two types of mentor are those people who just say, well, well, Peter, you're very good and you should do what you want and it'll be fine. They're really good mentors. And then the other people say, uh, Peter, you should work on blood pressure or you should work on nephritis or, or whatever. They're really bad mentors. You just remember that if you're aspiring to be a mentor. Don't tell people what to do, please. Uh, just give them confidence. And the reason for stating this is not only was this uh, tractable, not everyone thought it was tractable, but I'm going to argue it was tractable. Um, it was an unfashionable subject. People had tried to do it, they, they, but they were doing the wrong sort of experiment. They were experimenting with whole animals when what we wanted was the molecular mechanism. So what you have to know is if possible, use the system that simplifies the question you're asking. If you look for association across a heterogeneous position, it will be difficult to draw conclusions. So because of this, the conclusions have been drawn were, were not terribly impressive. They were largely incorrect. And I think in the face of multiple incorrect conclusions, the subject became unfashionable. So why does that matter? And what's important, this is probably the most important part of the lecture. Um, the whole world will draw you, for the young people, the whole world will draw you to a fashionable question. 
What do I mean by that? Peer review, excessive peer review. The journals will publish you if you're in a fashionable field. The funders will fund you if you're in a fashionable field. The mentors will tell you to do it. Uh, enormous pressure will be brought to bear on you to work in a fashionable field. Do not do that. Uh, we will find the field is overcrowded already or intractable or both. So I will demonstrate the importance now of entering a unfashionable field because to be clear, I don't have a PhD. And I don't have any training in biochemical science. I, I, I was a doctor. Now, um, there, was, there, was another there was an entrance to the field that said we had to study it at the right level. So we're getting to the technical half of the lecture now. I, I apologize for those who, who don't do this thing. I, I'll, I'll try to make it as, as simple as possible. But, but we wanted a simple system, which was not a whole animal. It was cells in culture. Uh, and this is a work of H. Franklin Bunn in Harvard. It's a very simple experiment. EPO, uh, the thing that makes the, the, the response to donation of blood and the thing that made Fitzgerald's hemoglobin go up, um, the, it's made in the kidney and the liver. I'm a kidney doctor, so I thought that this was a good subject for me. And the belief was that there were very, because of the precision of that, there were very special cells in the kidney and liver that, that, that make that make the EPO. And that's where the sensor, the thermostat, would be regulating that response. Uh, but we couldn't get the cells, and that's another story. No one has got the cells out of kidney. Frank got them out of liver. So now we, didn't have, we had a much more homogeneous system, much easier to manipulate. And Frank did that simple experiment. You'll notice the oxygen level before it goes up. It, 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 it is rather low. That's because your tissue oxygen is much lower than the oxygen you breathe. That's because of the gradients required for transfer. So, so this is a technical experiment. This is what we had to do. At every gene, there is like an addresser graph that tells the gene to be come on in the muscle or the blood cells or the brain cells. In our case, tells it to come on under low oxygen. And we do this by, we find these things out by, by, by cutting and pasting. Uh, and you see this little black bit? This is the EPO gene. This little black bit is the addresser graph. And what we do is find that by cutting and pasting, cutting bits off, seeing what happens. And we put it on another gene. And this is what, this is what we see. That this, this, I hope you can see it. This is normoxia and hypoxia. And you see it, 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 it's induced there. And that means we've got that address graph, we've isolated, we've put it on something else, and the aim was to go backwards from the gene up, up to the oxygen sensing process that we thought would be so interesting. So that's the first step there, the, 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 the isolation of that sequence in EPO producing cells. But this is the simplest experiment. I, well, it's the most important experiment I ever did. It's one of the simplest experiments I ever did. What would happen if you put that address graph into a cell that didn't make EPO? Was it, was it going to work, or, or what, 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 was, what was going to happen? We, we did that, and with a bit of fiddling around, you see, we found the same, we found the same results. And um, initially, that was a little bit irritating. Someone said, well, it, it's something nonspecific. It isn't. It, you know, everyone knows the EPO is made in the liver, and you've got it in some other cells. So there must be something wrong with that. But uh, I would say the data there is plain as pie. And we got quite excited then, because the implication was people had said, you don't need to work on EPO because Amgen Corporation has made EPO, so you can use it as a medicine. We don't need to know how it's, how it's regulated. But now the possibility was it did all sorts of other things. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was important. So um, you can't read this letter. It was just as well, in a way. Uh, it's not a very good letter. I, I, I drove to the offices of Nature magazine in my old dilapidated sports car to make sure that the manuscript actually got to the journal office. And I thought I'd, 
I burst into the editor and, and, and they would immediately see the importance of the work, you know, like myself, and, and, and agree to, to publish it. The, 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 that was on Monday, Thursday, as you know, that's the day before Good Friday, it comes about in April. This letter's dated August, so they took a while before they rejected it. And you can't read it, but the underlined letter says, we had difficulty in finding reviewers for this manuscript. Well, you know, frankly, I didn't think it needed review. I thought the old results and the implications were obvious. But, but that's, if they say that to you, you're on to good thing. That means that it's a new field. There aren't full of peer reviewers and other people who are crowding out the field. And um, well, it was correct. And, um, We've learned all sorts of things. That's that's um, we're now interested in cardiology and cancer and lung disease and whatever. But at the time, we were interested in what's the next step. It was a little bit more technical now, but I want to draw some general conclusions. Same principle, transfer of it within that within HIF, which, which Greg Semenza identified. Um, there would be sequences that interact with the oxygen sensing. So HIF binds the addresser graph, one step. Now, second step, what binds to HIF? What, what alters HIF? And we do the same thing. We take a bit of it and we transfer it onto something else. And we say, you know, what, so if it transfers, that's the bit that is working with the oxygen sensor. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, we found three bits that, that would confer oxygen sensitivity on something else. So each of those three bits must be acting, interacting with the upstream thermostat sensor that we wanted to find. And we thought then there would be something, there would be a clue, there would be something common between those three bits that we could easily see, and then we'd know what it was. The first problem is we couldn't see anything in common. People thought, those who are uh, scientists in the audience will know that everyone knows that signal transduction is made by protein phosphorylation, the putting of phosphate groups on and off proteins. So I mean, will there be a, a thing that, that binds to these phosphate groups? It must be in these sequences and you'll be able to see where it is. Um, but Chris Pugh, who my great friend and colleague, he mutated every, every phospho except or uh, amino acid in that thing, made no difference. Again, we, we had difficulty publishing this work. People said, well, this is negative. We, this is all negative work. He published a lot of mutations that make no difference. And one of the reviewers even suggested we were overfunded to do this work. It, it, but you know, it was important. It was a puzzle at the time. It excluded the mainstream hypothesis, right? Excluded the mainstream thinking. So it actually was just as important in direction as, as positive work. I, I just want to speed a little bit. Because the next clue, so what was it? We were stumped. We, we spent a line wandering around, but, but there was some aspect of this signaling system that was clearly new. And often clues come from clinical medicine. I, you know, I'm a clinician, uh, as, but it, it wasn't me who made the, the first connection. Uh, Rick Klausner, William Kalin, Orthon Eliopoulos. Several people noticed that in kidney cancer, you often got more blood cells, like we said Fitzgerald had noted as altitude, like when you donate a, a, a unit of blood. So something about that kidney is making the body make more blood cells and, and, and they noted a connection uh, with the genes that we had described by this time that were responsive to oxygen as well as EPRO. But they, they, they didn't, miraculously for me, they didn't make, they didn't understand the mechanism and, and, and we understood the mechanism. And here's another lesson. Why, why were we able to do this against the might of United States biochemistry? And the reason is this, and this is one for the deans here, uh, as well as the students. If you want to lead a field, 
you must make your own antibodies to the proteins you wish to investigate. This will be tiresome, it will be expensive, but you must do it. Because by the time you've been able to buy them commercially from Santa Cruz or whatever the company is, other people will have them. So we had the only antibody to one of those HIF proteins, HIF2. And there you see the very clear result that in, on the left, the VHL negative, the ordinary kidney cancer cell, there's very little regulation that shows high oxygen and low oxygen. It goes up a little bit, but not much. Look at the right-hand side of that, and you see the enormous difference between this lane and this lane. And that meant that VHL, the gene that is mutated in kidney cancer, was relevant to this system. They were unfortunate because we had the only antibodies to HIF2, so we were the only people who could do the experiment. Had they picked other cells, they might have found that HIF1, a, a, another similar protein, did the same thing, but they didn't. In their cells, only expressed HIF2, we had the only HIF2 antibody. So we made the connection, uh, and that was rather important in, uh, in the invitation to Stockholm, I guess. That's uh, how it is, you know. You might think that great brilliance is required, uh, you, you, need, uh, you need to find your question and you need to be lucky. Uh, so there's a lot of luck in it. Uh, and um, th this is, we, we, we then, other people, uh, we, we knew that this VHL, the gene that's defective in the kidney cancer, it's a destroyer. There, there are types of protein that are used to direct other proteins to what's called a ubiquitin proteasome pathway that gets rid of them. It's a sort of housekeeping thing. You get all the toys out, but of course the real problem, once the children got the toys out, it's putting them back in the right place, and, and the ubiquitin proteasome system is part of the cell organization. So we were now looking for uh, what it was that made VHL destroy HIF, destroy HIF in the presence of oxygen. And when that process doesn't happen, HIF builds up, and it does all those things, uh, transcription responses to hypoxia, in, including what Fitzgerald has described, the, the climatization response uh, with, with, with uh, blood cells, also blood vessel growth, so on and so forth. So we now had a classic biochemistry problem. What was it that was drawing these two bits uh, together? So here, um, we, we come to the business of being an unfashionable subject because as I told you, I'm not a biochemist and we didn't know very much biochemistry. So what we had to do was muddle along and read how other people had done it. And we, we knew we had to treat the HIF with, a, with an extract made from cells and then it would bind this destroying protein. Uh, and we did all sorts of things, mass spectrometry, fancy different cocktails of, of metabolites and things designed to test different systems. Uh, and then, uh, this was a eureka moment, um, we deduced the, 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 the process was prolyl hydroxylation. Now, it's a technical term, but this meant that the, an oxygen atom was being added to the proline ring of a residue in HIF. I, I, I can't simplify it beyond that. But I can tell you that this is one of the electrifying moments of science. To prove this, we made a peptide that had that oxygen atom synthesized in. And there you see the clear result. It's what I call a Sunday morning experiment. I'll come to that. The normal peptide needs treatment with an extract. It's blank there, it's positive there. The new one with the oxygen atom didn't need that. Why do I say Sunday morning? That means someone rang me at home with the results Sunday morning. That's a bit unusual that they do that. Uh, it means the experiment, of course, was done on a Saturday. That's a little bit unusual. It means also the result was considered of sufficient importance to go in and read on a Sunday morning. So that's, that's very special. But what's extremely special is the result was positive. We'll come to why, but nearly all biological hypotheses is incorrect. So usually they come in miserably on the Monday morning and tell you that the hypothesis has been destroyed. But this was this was positive, and it, it was it was it implied a 
uh, say, a prolyl hydroxylase. Now, the known prolyl hydroxylase, they, they modify collagen and they make it stronger. Uh, collagen's the stuff in your bones, your tendons. Actually, it's a very good candidate all along for the oxygen sensor because uh, these enzymes split dioxygen and they have an interaction with cobalt, that funny thing I told you about. So why didn't we think it was a prolyl hydroxylase all the time? Why, why do we have to do all this work? It's surely pretty obvious from these characteristics. And now we come to Darwin. So this is, you're, you're, you're not made by intelligent design. Your, your body's baroque, it's crazy. It's, it's completely illogical. So collagen is used to cause stiffness of certain proteins. How could the same process be used in oxygen sensing? Crazy, right? So this is, this is what deludes you. The fact that something was used in stiffness, as well, you can't have stiffness and oxygen sensing done by the same thing. Well, we'll see. But that was the implication. We were looking for one of these things. Now, again, we had a biochemical challenge with the whole of the US now on hot on the tail. Uh, obviously, it worked well for us, but how? And th th this one, again, it's a little reflection for the politicians, the funders, uh, not, not to set too many tasks as to why you're doing what you do. Uh, we, we, we met with this guy, Chris Schofield, who was working on antibiotic synthesis. Good thing to work on, but nothing to do with with our subject, right? Nothing, nothing obvious to do. But, but some of these enzymes, are similar to the collagen thing that, that makes a stiffness. Uh, Chris uh, solved the structure and he came up with this cartoon. This is broadly speaking what, what the secondary structure looks like. It's got these uh, coordination residues for iron. People believe this would be an iron containing protein that interacted with oxygen. Here are uh, Chris's uh, structure. And he deduced the human genome was now sequenced. So how did that help? Well, Chris deduced about 60 of these in the human genome, about, about 60. So I thought, well, one of them must be doing this, this, this job. Um, so another funny thing, uh, at the time, they also went to Stockholm. People were looking at the, uh, they were trying to work out the code for animal form. Uh, and they catalogued they decided to do it in the nematode worm, and they catalogued worms that look funny because they had mutations. And these worms look funny because they can't lay their eggs. Uh, those are eggs inside a worm. Uh, so what possible connection could a worm having difficulty laying eggs to, to what I go to talk about? Possibly this was one of the most boring uh, papers ever, ever written. They, they, they catalogued, I think, 149 different types of worm that had difficulty laying eggs. Now, where next? So the next story does belong in, in Dublin. Uh, I had a Dubliner working for me. He, he said, I don't really like this stuff at the bench. I want to be a bioinformatician, John O'Rourke. So I, I said to John, well, you know, perhaps then, John, you might see if there's a HIF, one of these proteins that we're looking for in man, in the worm, because a lot of the work been done on the worm. And, and he, he went away and he said, I think this is your gene. This is a gene. But we didn't know, so what did we do? We made an antibody. The same thing, we have to make your own antibodies, it's expensive. And this is, this is, this is John's antibody. And, um, here and it shows this is, you can't see it but this is the worms in Belgium. I don't have to have a license to do this you can just put the poor things in low oxygen and they induce HIF. So what's the significance what's the derailment of the whole story? Well one of Chris's mutants one of Chris's candidates turned out to be one of Bob Horowitz's the, the egg-laying mutants. Now, if you have a mutant, that's quite useful for deducing function. So the mutant will not work, like the enzyme won't work in 
low oxygen. So what you see here is the end of the story. Uh, that, that's, that's the induction of HIP in a normal worm. And this is in Eggle, egg laying defective number nine. So number nine was the ticket. And I remember Andy Epstein bursting through the office door said, Eggle nine, it's your gene. And, and sure it was. That's, um, that's the story, and that's what I'm telling you that all this was. It is an unprecedented signaling system, a regulatory oxygenase, splits molecular oxygen, remember O2, two atoms of oxygen, puts one on that proline ring, and that makes an alcohol group, which you'll remember can hydrogen bond, and that hydrogen bonding associates the HIF with BHL, destroys it in the presence of oxygen. So um, that's a funny thing. We've just got one more bit of Darwin to come to before the day room on. And it's a funny thing, isn't it? You, you make a protein and then you destroy it. Why, why, would you, why would you do that? Why would you switch? Why would you have that type of switch? Why would you need to make the thing energetically and then destroy it in the presence of oxygen? That's what I'm telling you happens. You have the thing going round and round and round and then no oxygen can't go round and round. And that's a signal to adapt to low oxygen. Uh, but in fact, since our work, all four eukaryotic, the uh, kingdoms of life, they use the same principle, but different components. Protein oxidation, destruction, resynthesis. Stupid system, really. Very inefficient, very counter-logical. And um, the truth is that um, if people, of course, write reviews in science. That, that means you you sort of think what something might be and you write it down rather than doing experiments. And um, we'd all written these reviews uh, of what the oxygen sensor might be. They were all wrong. Uh, and the more erudite the reviewer, the more wrong they were, really. A a any reasonable person would conclude that the purpose of the review was to confuse the field and put the workers off finding the answer. They're all wrong. Yet I've said the answer was obvious. Thomas Perlman even said it at the Nobel thing. He said this one, of course, they'd given us a prize then, so it didn't matter. He said it's obvious. And, and, and sure enough, it is. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain this, um, why it is that it's always wrong and why Darwinian evolution is, is not understood by most scientists, I would say, at least its implications are not understood. I'm going to explain this to you. Uh, you're neutral here in Ireland, I, I, I think. I'm going to explain it by reference to the European motorway system. Motorway system. So, um, well, let's do the science first. HIF, it, 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 I've written it out there, it, BH, it's a basic helix loop helix pass protein with these, these bits on the end. We'll we, we just go through that. So basic, that's part of the protein, basic helix. Those proteins are in all eukaryotic species, yeast uh, uh, and uh, plants, animals. Um, the PAS domain, that's the next bit of HIF, um, that's in all species, including bacteria, where it does sensing functions, including the sensing of oxygen. So why wouldn't it be that the PAS domain was the oxygen sensor in this one? People say, well, it's obvious it must be the PAS domain. But what I've shown you is, in fact, the enzymes that, that do something different. They, they oxidize the protein that signals for its destruction, nothing to do with the PAS domain. And they're actually in all species. And, um, then there's another one actually on the end that does that other site that I talked about that could confer oxygen sensitivity. So you're built up, you're pasted, you're pasted bits of bits of, of, of the thing, same things are used over and over again. So prolyl hydroxylation is used for stiffness, and then it's there, it's used for oxygen sensing. Extremely confusing. So what about the motorways? Well, you work on, you ride on the on the autobahn. Uh, and uh, say you want to go to Stuttgart, you're driving to Dusseldorf. Stuttgart's on the right-hand side. There's a big sign that says Stuttgart. You're sat now, it says 
turn right to, to Stuttgart. And what do you do when you turn right? You turn right, you go to Stuttgart. You get there, you go to Stuttgart. That's what the sat -nav says, that's where you go. Where's this? It's not Ireland, it's not England, it's not the Autobahn. Where is it? This is France. <laughs> we have the good fortune to have a house in the south of France. And people say, you know, the French, they've got better things to do than make motorways, particularly in the south. <laughs> so if, you, if, you, if you're coming along here, um, our house is down here. This is Chiana Tan. Uh, and you have Nice here and you have Cannes here. You, you're coming along the motorway, you have to get to Giorno Panda. You come up here, you go up, you go up into the forest, you go round there, come back down, you go under the motorway, over the motorway, under the motorway, round the motorway, then you go to Giorno Pan. Now your sat nav, you're not going to deduce this, it's not, your sat nav is it's going to mislead you. Um, the only way to get to Giorno Pan is trial and error, and there'll be a fair amount of error, and then you learn how to do the route. Now, what is, the, what is the twist? Why is this? So the, the Germans, they build motorways by engineering. The French, they use existing bits of road and they cobble them together to do what they want to do. And that is the difference between the way you're made and the way some people think you're made. You're, way, you're made like a French motorway, but, but the designers, the, the you know, people who want us to be logical, they think you're made like a German motorway. So this is the most important thing I have to tell you. Um, and, and let's just imagine, see, that, so this is, this is the totality of the HIF system. It does all these things, and I think that the HIF system exists, so it just gets used for something else and else and else and else. Whether they're all to do with the control of oxygen, I don't know, because Darwin keeps using all the same things again and again and again. I haven't told you in the interest of time that there are other systems that do this and they interact. So enormous complexity in oxygen homeostasis, enormous complexity. Not just complex, but as we've said, like a French motorway, incomprehensibly complex. Um, so uh, the French scientist Francois Jacob put it rather beautifully, nature is a tinkerer, not an engineer. Um, Haldane on that exposition, he saw this and this is what he wrote. He, he obviously flirted with, with vitalism. He, he who looks for definite causal changes in physiological phenomena finds in place of them a network of apparently infinite complexity. The physiologists who led the revolution uh, against uh, vitalism did not see this network. Well, we're not going to revert to vitalism, and I'm going to argue, and I've shown you, I hope, an atomic level solution, in a way, to this, this problem. But, but, but here is the rub. Uh, nature is a tinkerer, not an engineer. Can we then engineer a drug? Well, it wasn't my intention. But in fact, there are two drugs uh, that owe to this, this, this work, in a sense. One, to down-tune the system for cancer, which needs blood supply, and the other to up-tune it for, for anemia. So this is, this, is the, this is the rub, though. Um, the pharmaceutical industry aspires, uh, as do policy, aspires to engineering, not tinkering. Whereas you're made by tinkering, not engineering. But those drugs, that they're on, on, on the market. So the final, the final words of the song, you can't always have what you want, but if you try, sometime you find you get what you need. Uh, the famous words of um, Sir Michael Jagger and Mr. Keith Richards, who knew a little bit about drug discovery, I guess. Um, <laughs> But they had it. I mean, that, 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 that's it. You, you, it's all right, this precision medicine. But that's not the way you're made. You're Baroque. You're, you're like the, the Juan Le Pan junction. And there's an hour of trial and error in drug discovery. And if you don't embrace that, there'll be trouble. So I'll stop there. A grateful thanks to a lot of people. I can't mention them all. And this is my group on a sunny day in Oxford. And that's my...
that's my component of, of this evening. over the <laughs> I won't know what to do in this chair <laughs> so don't touch this thing whatever it is I think it looks expensive <laughs> so uh, thanks very much Peter uh, so my name is Cormac Taylor I'm a uh, as, as uh, Mary introduced at the start a uh, physiologist in University College Dublin uh, I've been fortunate enough to work in the field of oxygen sensing and hypoxia really since it's it's beginning and at least it's beginning for me in the early 1990s around the time that HIF was actually first cloned um, by, by Greg Semenza. Um, and uh, one of the great thrills about working in the field is to see it go from very uh, basic uh, um, blue skies research, really looking into very fundamental uh, biochemical and physiological me mechanisms up to the point where a, uh, where a drug um, uh, has actually entered into the clinic and is now uh, passed and is used uh, for, for the treatment of anemia. Um, so what I wanted to do today, rather than giving a respondent's talk myself, is I have a few, I always kind of dreamed about being Mark, this is going to sound strange, but about being Michael Parkinson um, and uh, having a sort of a, a questionnaire's <laughs> approach looking across my legs here. Um, and uh, what I wanted to ask uh, Peter is, um, first of all, thank you, this is Peter's third talk in Ireland actually in the last, uh, in the last six months, so we really appreciate the time that, that you've given over uh, to us. Um, I'd like to ask about um, the discovery of HIF and how important the um, uh, non-directed science that was uh, carried out in the beginning was in terms of uh, really not knowing what the end point would be. I think you mentioned that what you discovered was a thousandfold more than you expected, but it's probably a thousandfold less than what it can be and what it will be as we discover more. Um, and really, it's uh, maybe to discuss and get your thoughts on the importance, uh, particularly in the, in the case of funding of science, of, of basic research and, and applied uh, um, research. Sure. No, no, no. Well, this, I, I hope, came across. And to, to re-emphasize, um, it is a choice of question that is going to determine your career. But for the younger people, some people have made that decision. But if you ask the right question, you may get an answer. So there's a lot of luck in research because that question can't easily be defined. But as I say, it, it must be one of your own. You, you will need to train technically, uh, no doubt, in a, in, a, in a famous and competent lab. But if you follow that, you, you, you will you will not, you may succeed in publishing your work in, in Nature or Cell, but it, you're unlikely to succeed in, in defining an answer to a problem because other people are, are doing it. So you, mu you must find your own question uh, and it must be tractable and then it might turn out to be important. So in, in, in this case, people said, we, we don't need to, un well, if you want to be a serious academic uh, nephrologist, kidney specialist, you will have to work on either blood pressure regulation or, or glomerulonephritis, because that's what people in nephrology work on, and that's what you're going to have to do if you want to be a professor of nephrology. And, and that advice was extraordinarily bad extraordinarily bad. Um, it, unfortunately, I had, I had good people who, who stood by me, David Weatherall and John Bell, who nurtured me without influencing what I was going to do and provided the, 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 the tuition, the funding to, to set going on this EPO thing. Um, Terry would know it's important there, Terry Lapp. But, but m most people didn't think this had any, you know, it was, wasn't, it was a niche area that, that wasn't worth all the, the trouble because people had recombinant EPO. So, but this happens time and time again, that, that the significance of the work is, is, is not understood often until many years after the solution is made. I, I can't emphasize that more. I, I was asked to talk at the Crick about, about Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA. Um, 
Now, that was initially an important discovery, uh, and I would say much more important than what I've told you. Uh, but uh, they knew um, that by finding that, they would likely understand the copying mechanism underlying hereditary. And that's what they did say, and that's in their famous letter to nature. What they did not know was that the same mechanism of copying would be used to amplify DNA, which you cannot do for proteins or other molecules, and therefore a whole realm of biochemistry was opened by the copying of DNA to millions of copies, the polymerase chain reaction that diagnoses the coronavirus. None of that was known. And, and this, is, this is almost always the case in science, that the, the significance and utility of the knowledge, like electricity, is not appreciated at the time of creation and cannot be appreciated before creation. Cannot. So that's my argument for, for knowledge, for knowledge's sake. There's only one qualification of knowledge. It's not completeness. It's not utility. It's accuracy. And, and, and that is fundamentally important. That's great. Yeah, no, and, and I think that, that is, there's great lessons in that for us, how we, how we approach the, the role of knowledge generation in university settings as well, and knowledge for the sake of, of, of understanding uh, accurate knowledge is, I think, is, is, is a very, really strong point. Um, to touch on that a little bit, you mentioned David Weatherall, and I know from reading your bio, there was a, a, um, you, a nameless chemistry teacher you had along the way. I wanted to ask a little bit about role models and mentorship um, for you. and. Who were the main role models that you had along the way, and, and uh, how has that shaped the way in which you've applied your own mentorship techniques? Yeah, well, I, I've sort of deliberately been a bit controversial on this, because most people believe mentorship is important, and to a degree it might be. I, I, I drew two things out. I wanted to be a, not a nephrologist, actually, an, an NHS nephrologist, and that was, that was quite difficult to do. So people said, Peter, you've got to distinguish yourself if you want to do that. So I, I took to writing clinical case reports. That's the first thing I did. And, and, and these things, if someone nominates you to a major price, you have to sort of take them off your CV or, or sort of put them to one side so people can't read that your first paper wasn't in Nature. It was in, <laughs> it was in the Postgraduate Medical Journal of Yorkshire or something. Uh, and, um, but the thing about the case report that was important, it teaches you to draw conclusions from a fixed data set, which is actually quite important in science. And, and, and the second uh, thing is it teaches you to look across a whole panorama of patients and pick the ones from which you can make conclusions. So that's the same as picking a research question. But then your problem is how do you get the technical training and there I was fortunate, because you must have it. So what you need is to do these case reports, and then you need a friend with a lab. And that was John, that was your question. That was John and David had, had the graciousness, the good heartedness. John to take me into his lab, which was working on immunogenetics. There was no chance I was going to be an immunogeneticist. It didn't work in the way people thought. I was doing EPO. And, and David was a bit closer. He was doing hemoglobinopathy, um, but actually wasn't doing EPO. Just generous. So um, that if, if you're a if you're a dean or you're leading medicine, there is a great tendency to to make it neat and to say, well, this this guy doesn't really fit, so we don't want him in the department. We want it all nice and neat. This section does this. This section does that. This section does the other. Uh, I eventually did run a department. The, of a department, and I learned that um, almost everyone was valuable. They never quite knew who was going to bring the bird home. So they, those guys were tolerant and generous, and, and that's actually, uh, and tolerated risk. That's another thing for the funders, that unless you tolerate risk, and I mean it, most things will go down you're not going to discover. Yeah. Discover is, is diversity, it's risk. Yeah. That's great, yeah. And, and I think it really struck me, it was quite, uh, th those words you used where you said, don't tell people what to do, but give them confidence and give confidence. them the space to you do need, the confidence. You need, you need, you need confidence. Yeah. And I think that is important in terms of the, uh, the funding as well of, of Blue Skies research and new ideas and um, as opposed to huge 
um, conglomerates of research to give people opportunities and, uh, and space to... It's a Darwinian thing. Yeah. Again, there are certain things that you have because uh, you were adapted for an environment which is different from the one you live in. It was a dangerous environment. People who are historians here will know that, that most of the bodies dug up from 10,000 BC or whatever, uh, they died a natural death. Mm -hmm. Someone finds an arrow in the, in the cranium or, or in, the, in the thorax or, or, or what. So it was a dangerous environment. Actually, the laboratory, <laughs> with all respect to health and safety, <laughs> It's not a very dangerous environment, it really isn't. Um, but you've got that anxiety and that conservatism that, that, that is, I think, intrinsic to, to not moving out of your own cave into the next one. And it's a largely redundant emotion in, in the lab, over-anxiety. So confidence was, was, most people need, most people are anxious, they need confidence. Can I ask you also, um, and I know you've made a strong point of this in other talks about the importance of knowing the literature, knowing the history, and you gave us a great uh, example of it in the context of the discovery of oxygen, um, but actually really knowing the, the old literature in the field. And I guess in some ways I feel that the modern technologies such as PubMed and the access to abstracts very, very rapidly has reduced a little bit the depth of, of reading, perhaps increased the scope, but d decreased the depth of reading of some of our younger scientists. Do you think that that's a... A, a skill we have to be careful not to lose? We have. I mean, you know, the truth is, had we led the literature on collagen biochemistry of the 1960s and 70s, we might have deduced yeah. the mechanism without, without all this work. But I'm going to argue, I'm going to argue for education, because, you know, the human brain is, people don't appreciate it, it has to be loaded up from scratch, from scratch. And, and so uh, education is, is, is key. Without it, we can do nothing. And people don't really understand that everything is dependent on education. In science, the most interesting thing, I would, I, I would argue that it would be important to teach history, not through the political and military history, but the history of science, because it had more to do with the societal advance. And I would argue that it was more important to teach science through the history of science, because the way to learn discovery is to learn the history of discovery. Quite, people have a, an odd idea that it, it, it's brilliant, people work things out. It is usually chaotic. Our work is, is not unusual. The story of the solution of DNA is also chaotic. As the discovery of insulin, actually as the discovery of penicillin, the, the, and, and, and this, this needs to be appreciated both by those who are not scientists and those who are. Great, thank you. Um, I've just realized in, in the interest of time, we've just got a couple of, of, of uh, questions left, but one that I can't help, and I'm, I know we hadn't discussed this before, but one that I, I can't help asking you about, because um, I went off on a, on a 2 a.m. kind of wormhole on the internet last night. I was watching uh, Peter's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, and he talked, as he did tonight, about Mabel Fitzgerald, and being Irish, I, I saw Fitzgerald in there. I thought we'd be able to claim something but apparently no <laughs> or at least it goes well, the, so name, the name must be a clue you would, I know you think so must mean something. I couldn't find any direct uh, a, a relation to Ireland but um, but I do think it brings up uh, something important and, and, and as I read at two o'clock in the morning more and more about um, Mabel Fitzgerald and her life as a female physiologist at a time when women were not allowed to be members of the Royal Society weren't allowed to, to do a lot of uh, things in uh, at, at an academic level uh, she was a real trailblazer and did it with a great attitude and I, I think it was just a, a great um, uh, a, a segue into discussing maybe the importance of diversity in research and how we need to be able to uh, continue that. Uh, it, was very, it was very nice. We had a big um, hypoxia conference here in Dublin, uh, Keystone Conference, and it was the weekend of the marriage referendum, if you remember back in 2014. It was a, a time of, of, of great celebration around Ireland. Um, and I'm just curious about, about, you know, on the context of Babel Fitzgerald and, the, and as you spoke about today, why it's important to emphasize the, the importance of, of diversity within our, our research, which wasn't always the way as we see from those own studies. Discovery is diversity. Diversity is discovery. 
I, I mean diversity in ev every conceivable way. So I count myself as diversity at the Crick. You know, I am a white man, uh, so that's not very diverse. But I am a clinician. And people think the purpose of clinicians in the Crick is to translate the work of the Crick into medicines. That's not true. It couldn't possibly be done. The pharmaceutical industry needs to do this, all sorts of things. The Crick's completely unsuitable to do that. The purpose of having clinicians and the diversity in all other respects is to broaden the portfolio of the Crick's ideas, to broaden its agenda. And um, you probably know this, that I, I, when I took the Department of Medicine, I had all sorts of different I, uh, pieces of advice, most of it not very good. But one thing sticks in my mind, um, people said there were many very clever people have run entirely sterile departments in their university. And in some ways, there's a correlation between the power of in the intellect and the sterility of the department. Uh, and that is because if you're intolerant of other people's ideas, you may feel it's stupid or, or, or not important or not relevant, then of course you constrain the department to your own horizon. Whereas actually the discovery has to entrain much wider horizons. So amongst all other things, um, you know, diversity is important in every aspect of, 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 of human uh, organization. But if you're running a discovery institute, <laughs> let's be clear, it is your bread and butter. Well said. Yeah, I agree. And it's a broad church, the, 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 the scope of diversity. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, finish up with, with just one last question. And, and I, I was at a I've done a few uh, vivas recently, so I'm going to ask you a similar question to what I'd asked the students at the end of the vivas: is what was the most important, the most important non-scientific lesson you've learned to date uh, during your your career? The most important non-scientific non non-scientific non thing. That, 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 well, that was one from being head of department that that diversity was important. We, you know. Things would change so that the the, the ref would come in and. What they wanted to know was was patient experience. I remember Anne McPherson's department, patient experience. It, it never published anything in a high-ranking journal. So it was well, Anne, she's no good, you know. Yeah. And then and then a lot of the funding was given on the basis of patient experience. So you know, Anne was then sent to stage. So I learned. I think I learned. I learned that. I, I, I learned that, that so many people have, have different things to say. Yeah, and I think that came across very clear in the, the presentation as well, that, the, that to have multiple different, and everybody had a value. It's finding that value is the, mm. the key thing. So, so I'm going to um, uh, invite the president uh, back up to uh, take any questions from the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, totally fascinating. Let's open it up. Right. Catherine, you need to wait for the mic, Catherine. Also, I'm rather deaf, so okay, you, I'll, you I'll might have to repeat the questions for me. I, I'm, I'm wearing. Um, okay. Hello. No. Yes, I know. Catherine is having okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, that was fantastic. I have so many questions, but one of them is really quite basic. So are there polymorphisms in the oxygen sensors and in, in humans, and would that account for athletic ability or under different conditions? Or if kind of the other version of it is through evolution and through different animals, you know, for example, sea mammals that dive and, and tolerate different oxygen. Is there anything yeah, about? No, there are several good questions there. Uh, David Weatherall, of course, human geneticist, so he said you'd have to use human genetics. And in fact, yes, each component, uh, the hydroxylase, the HIF, and the VHL, all show polymorphism in different human populations. Several of them in the Tibetan altitude adapted uh, uh, population. Uh, what, what, what is a little bit interesting uh, is you can 
we haven't done this properly, but you can take the trichoplax, that's the most basic animal, and put its oxygen center into a human cell, and it works quite nicely. I don't quite understand that, so the adaptation over you know, that massive difference in speciation presumably is at different levels, like there are more HIF targets, or there are more of those addresser graph labels at each HIF target, rather than being a different oxygen sensor. So for those in the technical field, it's unlike hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is adapted in diving mammals, so crocodile hemoglobin is different in its oxygen affinity for yours and mine. That's not been clearly shown at that level in, in this system, but it has in Tibetans, oddly enough. Yes, there's a gentleman there. I was just wondering, a wonderful lecture, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, given that we essentially always adapt and respond to our environments, how should we optimize our environments to optimize our oxygen sensing capacity? What are the things that are within our control in their environment that we could change? In terms of oxygen? Yeah. Well, yes, um, interesting. Uh, P people try to uh, you know, train athletes, as you know, because you earn large sums of money by winning races. And it, it, it's not actually that easy. And it, it's interesting that it hasn't been, to my knowledge, not possible uh, to demonstrate that altitude training really improves performance. Uh, why is that? Because it's complicated. So altitude training will will alter your cardiovascular physiology. As far as we can see, it, it will also down-tune your mitochondrial complement. They're, they're the energy-creating organelles. So if you have less mitochondria, you, you can consume less oxygen, probably run less fast. But, but on the other hand, you've made more blood, so you could run faster. So you, there'll be multiple factors which it is possible that for a particular sport, you could improve performance by adaptation to a particular... People are also interested in whether you could do this with disease. And I get a lot of calls from people wanting me to consult with them about that. And I don't know, it's quite possible you could... Pre, you know, this is preconditioning or, or conditioning for different diseases. You could do it, but it's not very easy to predict. I also warn you one thing, it's also dangerous, very dangerous. So, so hypoxia, people talked about COVID, hypoxia is not unpleasant. In fact, it's euphoric, hence the balloonist, hence bad judgment on Everest, hence the balloonist going to altitude, hence, very sadly, uh, people um, putting their heads in gas ovens and not taking them out in time. They don't all intend to, to kill themselves. But, but, but so, so the, I, I've had people ring me up and say, we've got this thing and you can walk along, you can breathe a hypoxic atmosphere and, and it'll, it'll condition your blood vessels. <laughs> you be very careful, it'll kill you. So, but, but you, the answer is it must be true that you could adapt performance. It's just because of the complexity, it's really difficult to predict. It may be worth mentioning just to come in there, with the, with, in terms of the drugs, the uh, hydroxylase inhibitors pretty quickly made their way into sporting and doping. That's an interesting one. We, we, we set up a company to make these drugs. We were unsuccessful. <laughs> I'm an unsuccessful entrepreneur. We, we backed the wrong company. Um, but we had to raise money, and um, this was 2002. We published the results in Cell, not a, not a popular newspaper, in, um, in 2001. And one of the bankers said, well, you might be interested in this. It says HIF prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors for performance. That meant uh, that people were surveying the academic literature for potential performance-enhancing drugs. They come by our paper. They'd already made the compounds, which were made as collagen prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors, and selling them to, to would-be athletes. No idea whether it made them better or worse or what, but it was on the market within a year, 
and we're still waiting the major FDA approval. Hopefully it'll be through next year, 20 years down the line. So that's the difference between just taking the drug without any observation of safety and getting all the trials and safety things through 20 years. So I'm afraid that in the interests of time, we are going to have to draw this fascinating uh, discussion to a close. I just want to make a couple of comments, if I may. In thanking you, uh, Professor Ratcliffe, um, you have demonstrated, I think, that not just the science of medicine, but the art and the craft of medicine as well. And it has been enormously uh, both instructive and I think really entertaining for us to listen to you on your journey. But there are huge policy lessons in it for those of us who talk about funding research as we do in this academy, because the importance not just of blue skies research or of allowing uh, people to think through what it is that fascinate them, but also the chaos that we, uh, we live with. And it's very reassuring to hear that because when policymakers, I think, try to make us close down on things to listen to you is really inspiring. So I would like to thank you very much. I am sure the audience will, uh, will thank you in a moment. I just want to thank our secretary, Mary O'Dowd, for, uh, for organizing this, um, this discourse program. The next discourse will be given by me on the 28th of February, and the subject is going to be the critical university exactly about um, the importance of institutional autonomy at a time when, as we know, it is uh, threatened. And I shall be in conversation with um, Professor Brian McCraw, and I hope people will join us. And to the young people who are here tonight, it's great to see you here um, and to hear about how you should be mentored. So thank you for coming. Please do join us for refreshments and thank you to all our uh, participants who are online and sadly will not be joining us for refreshments. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you.